Hello friends, I'm Conrad and welcome to Bad Guy Breakdowns, the series where we look at the most iconic villains to grace the silver screen. Let's get into the villainy. Steel isn't strong, boy. Flesh is stronger. Let's start by addressing the elephant in the room. Yes, this week we're talking about James Earl Jones' villain in Conan the Barbarian. Yes, in last week's episode I did call him Thulsa Doon. I also called it Conan the Barbarian, though apparently other people do that too, so you can take it up with them. But Thulsa Doon isn't his real name, it's Thulsa Doom. Not to be confused with Tulsa Doom, his American cousin who runs a Waffle House in Oklahoma. So who is Thulsa Doom? Well, he was originally an evil sorcerer with a face like a skull from author Robert E. Howard's stories in the Weird Tales pulp magazine. He wasn't a Conan villain at first, he actually predates Conan, appearing alongside another Howard creation, Cull the Conqueror, in 1928. But only parts of this character found their way into John Milius' 1982 movie. A producer called Edward Pressman initially acquired the rights to the character of Conan in 1978. And after watching the weightlifting documentary Pumping Iron, he enlisted Arnold Schwarzenegger for the project. Nascent director Oliver Stone, who would go on to make movies like Platoon and JFK, was hired to write a script treatment for it. But that's as far as the project initially went. It wasn't until the rights and Stone's script were sold to another producer, Dino De Laurentiis, that things began moving again. The first step was finishing the script, then finding a director, and fortunately John Milius could do both. De Laurentiis wanted rewrites because Stone's script was too violent, and so naturally they turned to this man. I love Viking things, and I always wanted to do a Viking movie, and when I was a surfer one of my first names was Viking Man because I had this great big sword. You know what, that's a lot to unpack, let's just move on. With the script finished and a star in place for the role of Conan, all that was required to start production was to round out the cast. Sandal Bergman, fresh off a role in Bob Fosse's All That Jazz, was brought on board as Valeria. James Earl Jones once again stepped into the role of an arch-villain, utilising his stage training to wonderful effect, and they even managed to snag a small role for Max von Sydow as King Osric, supposedly because his son loved the Conan comics and he liked the idea of a more fun role working with a more action-focused director. And Milius, who uh, is very fond of swords and uh, decapitations and things. Okay, what's going on with John Milius? Could we maybe not let him buy any more edged weapons, please? Although say what you will about his unhealthy infatuation with swords, the man knew how to make a Conan movie. The end result was a critical and financial success, earning back $40 million domestically on a $20 million budget. Not to mention the longevity it has had, still being regarded as a classic to this day. And I think a significant factor in Conan the Barbarian's success was its cast. Schwarzenegger goes without saying, he's essentially a Frank Frazetta painting come to life. But for my money, getting James Earl Jones as the villain was the real feather in the cap. Managing to land the Star Wars guy just two years after The Empire Strikes Back must have felt like quite a coup at the time. And in analysing the version of Thulsa Doom we ended up with on screen, it's almost impossible not to draw comparisons between the two. In fact, Jones did it himself. The role I play is again the villain. He's the, I'll call, call him the uh, prehistoric Darth Vader. He's the Batman. He's a sorcerer. When you originally watch Conan the Barbarian, your first thought is probably, hey, why does this open with a Friedrich Nietzsche quote? And you're right to question it. Unfortunately, the answer is that there simply is no explanation beyond John Milius thinking Nietzsche was making a good point. But what opening his movie with a quote from a very real person who was alive either a long time after or a very long time before this movie is set achieves is simply confusing the audience. So let's clarify. According to Milius and Stone's screenplay, this picture takes place about 15,000 years before the present day. You know, because the film takes place uh, at a time of maybe 12 or 15,000 years ago, you know, and at that time, you know, there was... No and Thulsa Doom was intended to be the last member of a dying or very nearly dead race. Someone who was thousands of years old and a stranger to the world. 
Beyond the obvious name recognition of getting Darth Vader to be your bad guy, this was an enormous reason for casting Jones. He felt different to everyone else in the movie. Bergman had come from musical theatre, Jerry Lopez, who played Subutai, was one of Milius' old surfer buddies, and Schwarzenegger was a bodybuilder who was still very new to acting. Jones brought a gravitas and assuredness to the role that really anchors the movie, and allows Arnie and friends to have more fun in their performances and worry less about the acting. In fact, during filming, Schwarzenegger said this to John Milius. You must treat me, he said to John Milius, like a trained dog. I don't want to think about it, I don't want to remember lines, I want you to tell me exactly what to do. Having a quote-unquote proper actor to lend some dramatic legitimacy to their scenes really helped to relieve the less experienced performers of any pressure, and I think the results speak for themselves. So let's ask again, who is Thulsa Doom? Well, the character Jones portrays doesn't have a skull face, so that's one thing. Well, I guess he does have a skull under his face. I don't think that counts, though. He's still an evil sorcerer, but his magic is never really codified, which I think serves the mysterious origins John Milius intended for his character. We don't know how he can turn into a snake or seemingly hypnotise people, he just can. And by not knowing, it makes the boundaries of his power seem limitless. One thing we can say for absolute certain about Thulsa Doom, though, is this. Motherfucker loves snakes. Can't get enough of them. I just think they're neat. He's the head of the cult of Set, who use them everywhere from their iconography to guarding precious jewels in their ominous towers, which exist in cities across the world. Artist Ron Cobb landed himself a cameo in Conan and used it to tell the boys about the cult. They have spread to every city. Two or three years ago it was just another snake cult, now everywhere. First off, hi Ron, loved your work on Alien. Secondly, uh, how many snake cults do you have? More than one is too many. If you're moving to a city looking to set up some kind of shady religious group and you see that someone else has already called the snake for their cult t-shirts, you should pick another evil animal. Use spiders or a particularly angry cat. But as Ron confirms, they aren't just any old snake cult these days. They are THE snake cult and wield influence over most of modern civilization. And the big snake boy at the top of the scaly pile is our man Thulsa, who fortunately was played by a man who had plenty of experience in handling them. Luckily, as a soldier in the US Army, I was trained with the Rangers, and a part of our survival, we had to befriend the snake. Which... Oh wow, that's kind of heartwarming. The snake guy on set, Dr. Teva, must have been really thrilled to let you handle his animals. And at the end, you, of course, you ate him. Sorry, run that last part by me again? And at the end, you, of course, you ate him. Okay, yep, yeah, that's what I thought you said. Uh, just gonna... Just gonna move on. Let's talk about how Thulsa fits into this story and try to forget about James Earl Jones killing things. The first thing we see in this movie is James Earl Jones killing things. Ah, damn it! All right, it's not quite the first thing. First up, we learn about something called the Riddle of Steel before watching young Conan fishing in what is clearly solid snow. That's not a hole in the ice, Conan. That's just wet ground. It's a good thing that he knows about the Riddle of Steel because the riddle of where fish live seems to have eluded him. The next thing we see is one of Thulsa's boys. And look at how jazzed this guy is. He is absolutely thrilled to be out there in the fresh air doing some pillaging. And you can argue that the next 10 minutes paint the Doom Squad in a bad light, but at the very least it's clear to me that the people who serve under Thulsa love their work. During this raid on Conan's village, we also meet henchmen number one and two in Rexor and Thorgrim. Although the movie does an awful job of communicating their names to you, and this will probably be the last time I say them correctly. Thulsa kills Conan's mum and steals a sword before leaving Bebop and Rocksteady to sell him into slavery, where he becomes just outrageously jacked by pushing a big wheel around. Seriously, let me get in on that pushing a big wheel workout plan, Arnold. He fights in some pits, does some killing of his own before literally quoting the biography of Genghis Khan. You crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and they hear a lamentation of the women. <laughs> Don't think about it too hard, it's a cool line. Conan is freed by his slave master turned best friend and runs away from some wolves, which I mention only so that we can see this random fisheye lens shot that Millie has stuck in the escape sequence. It's like Conan briefly became trapped in a 90s skateboarding video. Actually, 
actually, it's also worth covering this so we can see some, frankly hilarious, behind the scenes footage of Arnie being pulled off a rock by a wolf. Let's watch that one more time. Haha, <laughs> never gets old. And that's the last time we see Thulsa Doom for almost half the movie. We're left with his underlings and influence over the land, chiefly the foreboding Tower of Set in the city of Zamora. The gang decide they want to rob it, though not before Conan punches out a camel. Nope, that's the wrong movie, though it is weird that there were two movies where someone punched an animal used for transport in an eight year period. Never mind that shit. Here comes Mongo! Mongo in this case meaning a transition to the scene where Conan and friends rob the Tower of Set. Rexor, who is played by former Oakland Raider Ben Davidson and definitely looks like a football player, is hanging out here doing cult stuff, which seems to mainly involve being worshipped by nubile young maidens, and to be fair, that tracks with my experience of cults. But the real star of the show for Team Doom guys in this scene is the big guard snake downstairs who watches over a jewel called the Eye of the Serpent, a puppet that took an entire team of people to animate so that Schwarzenegger could tussle with it. I honestly think it still looks great, particularly as blood gushes from its head after Conan has stabbed it, followed by Subutai, or in reality John Milius, the self-proclaimed best archer on set, and I had to do it because I turned out to be the best archer, peppering it with arrows before it is finally decapitated. Was it a good guard animal given it only started attacking the intruders after they had stolen the jewel and one of them had left the room? No, not in any way. But it did look cool, and in reality you own a big snake for appearances, not practicality. The gang, now featuring a romantic interest for Conan in Valeria, are asked to rescue the daughter of King Osric from the clutches of Thulsa Doom, because they've shown that they either don't care who he is or are too stupid to worry. So it's off to a massive set built on the side of a mountain, and we finally get to see Thulsa Doom again as he gives a speech to a crowd of his loyal followers, including Conan in a disguise that is laughably ineffective. He speaks a dozen languages, knows every local custom, he'll blend in, disappear, you'll never see him again. Not least because on arrival at the gathering he immediately presents a serpent medallion to one of the guards that is A. stolen from the Temple of Set, and B. only he has. No one else is showing medallions to that guard Conan, you fucking idiot, just keep it in your robes. Then the hell with you. Alright, settle down big guy. As you might expect, this goes badly for the Barbarian, and we are treated to a scene between him and Doom which is strangely reminiscent of the scene in Street Fighter the movie between Chun-Li and M. Bison. The day Bison graced your village was the most important day of your life. But for me, it was Tuesday. Thulsa Doom barely remembers ransacking Conan's village and talks about it like an old man might recall a woman he met in France during the war, with a mixture of nostalgia and creepiness, although he certainly remembers Conan killing his snake and is, frankly, pretty darn steamed about it. You broke into my house, stole my property, murdered my servants and my pets, and that is what grieves me the most. Now, to be fair, we know how James L. Jones treats his pets, and at the end, you, of course, you ate him. So I'm not sure he actually has any right to be mad about this. But he's got the upper hand and displays as much by commanding a girl to kill herself. It's a stunt woman called Connie Jansen who made that jump into a pile of boxes under a thin layer of cardboard, which is very reminiscent of a similar stunt fall in the Tower of Set after Valeria had slashed a guard with a sword and sent him tumbling down the hole at the centre of the tower. Basically, it's a wonder no one died filming this movie. And after this vulgar display of power, Doom leaves Conan to be crucified on the Tree of Woe by Toka and Razar, where he just straight up fucking dies. And then the movie ends. Or rather, it would if it weren't for the power of love, gods, some kind of witchcraft, and hand-drawn spirits in a scene that is reminiscent of Quaidan. In order to break Doom's clutches on Osric's daughter, and with a hankering for revenge, the gang sneak into one of his cave cribs. Now. I'm not a judgmental man, and what people do in the sanctity of their own homes is up to them. But, I don't understand how this place functions as a home. There's a room with people just butchering human corpses and scraping the innards into a green soup, which, you know, isn't great to begin with, but then a bunch of guys come along and carry the soup cauldron off seconds after one of the 
chefs? I'm not sure what the term is. Organ boys? Seconds after one of them has just dumped a load of fresh entrails into it, and those definitely aren't cooked. And then the next room I can barely show you because it's just a writhing licentious mass of human bodies. It's hard to spot exactly what they're doing, but there's a jaguar in that room, the horniest of all the big cats, and that should tell you everything you need to know. This is an absolutely terrible situation for someone to get food poisoning, and it's going to happen with that soup. Oh, and Thulsa Doom is in this room too, just hanging out at first. But as our heroes make their move to rescue Osric's daughter, he turns into a snake and pieces out. The transformation still looks pretty good. It's not at the level of something like an American werewolf in London, but then not much is. Timon and Pumbaa are left to battle Conan as the other two thieves deal with the rest of the guards, and we get a moment that still makes me laugh when they accidentally knock a pillar over with their hammers. It's so dumb, but it fits the tone really well, a perfect balance of schlocky violence and humour. Using the temporary reprieve, the gang seizes the princess. Ah! Someone get James L. Jones back to calm her down and then eat her. And at the end, you, of course, you ate him. The party make good their escape, though not before Thulsa Doom proves that snakes can also make pretty good arrows as well as guard dogs and food as he fires a Valeria-seeking serpent into her back. You stole his girlfriend, so he killed yours, Conan. It's only fair. And that sets us up for our conclusion. Valeria is dead, Thulsa Doom and friends are coming to get his girl back, and Conan is pretty mad. Time to gather up weapons and set some traps for Home Alone 10,000 BC edition. He will kill you! He has seen your fires! He will come for me and when he does, he will kill you! In the interest of balance, Conan and Subutai are up against it in this final clash. Even with Thulsa Doom hanging back and letting his minions do the work, they're still outnumbered by about 10 to 1. But also, that's Conan, you know, he's worth 100 bumbling muscular sidekicks, even if they did play for the Raiders. And it should come as no surprise that he's able to put most of them to death via a series of traps and weapons he has hidden around the place like some kind of crazy fantasy survivalist. Supertai gets stabbed in the leg, but pretty much no-sells it until the wizard who brought Conan back to life arrives to help. And Conan tricks Thorgrim into bashing yet another thing that he simply shouldn't bash, sending a wooden spike through his chest. He seems like he wants to quip after the trap is sprung, but gets stuck thinking of something to say, giving Rexor a chance to blindside him. This is almost enough to end the fight before Force Ghost Valeria in full Valkyrie regalia intervenes on Conan's behalf, giving the barbarian the opening he needs. Rexor is cut to ribbons, Doom tries to kill the princess with another snake arrow, but Subatai makes the save, and the sorcerer once again runs away. He's making a nasty habit of that. Never one to let a death in the family stop him from working, we catch up with Thulsa an indeterminate period of time later where he's back to the old preaching gig, trying to drum up support from his pro-snake cult base. Unfortunately, this time Conan has learned to use the temple's back door and silently approaches Thulsa's pulpit from behind. The villain's death was achieved with a solid leather harness that Jones wore under his robes, which allowed the effects team to fasten squibs to it while also protecting the actor from the sword blows, which, according to Schwarzenegger, he was properly going for. The effect is great. Conan approaches Doom, who claims to be a father figure to the barbarian, having played such a key role in forging him into the man he has become. Now is your father if it's not me. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. It doesn't. Conan may not understand how to fish, or read, but he's not about to bail on his plan for revenge at the moment of completion. He strikes Doom twice, on either side of his head, as gouts of blood pour out. His nemesis falls to his knees in front of the stunned crowd, and Conan deals the final blow, beheading Doom. And then the final humiliation comes, with Conan tossing the head down the steps of the temple, where it lands with the sound of a partially inflated rubber ball being kicked. That's embarrassing. And that's Conan the Barbarian. Thulsa Doom is a classic example of a villain who doesn't need to be in a lot of a movie to indelibly leave his thumbprint on it. His performance is so strong and charismatic that you feel the character's presence in every scene and the final inglorious death is so brilliantly unceremonious, because for all of his power and influence and posturing, ultimately he was still very mortal indeed. 
as Conan proved. Thank you for joining us on Bad Guy Breakdowns, and be sure to check out the next episode as we delve into an agent of chaos in the Coen Brothers' nihilistic masterpiece, Anton Chigurh in No Country for Old Men. Until then, I've been Conrad, and I'll see you next time.